Welcome to the webinar on Wound Assessment and Documentation, a Practical Guide. This webinar today is sponsored by Wound Rounds, the Electronic Wound Documentation Management System. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us on the webinar today. My name is Deborah Kurtz and I'm your moderator. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a few bookkeeping items that will help make your um, participation easier. For starters, you should be listening to this on audio through your computer, so make sure that your computer's not muted. Also wanted to let you know that no one can actually hear you, so all the participants are muted. At the end of the webinar, we'll be sharing the info. Muted. Unmuted. Sorry about that glitch, everybody. Um, we're back on, on online and wanted to remind everyone that participants are muted. There'll be an opportunity for you to see the contact information at the end of the webinar for our speaker today and that you can feel free to contact her if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with her after this webinar. The webinar today is being recorded and it will be archived for future viewing purposes. So that means that in the future people can view this webinar. But unfortunately, CEUs are only available for people who are listening in to today live and they will follow a procedure at the end of this webinar to order to submit for their CEU credits. So if you're listening to this in an archived form, know that future CER you, CEU opportunities will be made available to you. Just watch your email for upcoming webinars from Wound Rounds. For those of you who are interested in getting CEUs, uh, they are offered to the California Board of Nursing. And at the end of this webinar, you'll receive an email from Wound Rounds, which will contain some instructions on next steps for you to um, initiate that application process for your CEUs. So be certain to watch your email for that. And if you did not actually register for this webinar and are viewing it on someone else's computer, make certain that you get in touch with us at Wound Round so we can add you to our mailing list and make sure that you get CEUs for today's webinar as well. So with that, I'd like to let you know that we have a great program planned today and a really compelling speaker. Uh, for those of you who have had a chance to be on a Wound Rounds webinar before, you've been familiar with the, with the skills and presentation capabilities of Anne Schurig. Anne Schurig is a, a luminary within the woundostomy and continence nursing field. She's had several leadership positions within the industry and has lent her talents and skills to helping advancing the cause of woundostomy continence nursing. In addition to that, she also serves as the Director of Clinical Services for Wound Rounds, the sponsor of today's webinar. My name is Deborah Kurtz. I'll be acting as the moderator today for this event, and I do a lot of work within our industry and also within healthcare, helping these organizations to grow their revenues. So at this point, what I'd like to do is turn this webinar over to Ann Schurig, who's going to guide us through the actual learning objectives and content in today's webinar. And I know that we'll have a great time listening today to Ann Schurig. So let me hand it over to you, Ann. Thanks, Deb. Welcome, everyone. Today, for uh, purposes of CEUs, we're going to run through the objectives first. And today we're going to identify at least five types of wounds other than pressure, ulcers. We're going to describe parameters that are essential in providing a thorough wound assessment. We're going to list the three dimensions that should be measured in all wounds and identify and describe uh, different tissue types in the wound assessment. We're going to differentiate between undermining and tunneling. We're going to talk about the five characteristics that should be visualized when you're looking at the peri wound margin and identify at least two types of necrotic tissue that you might visualize in a wound bed. So let's get started. To understand how we're going to document about the skin, let's talk about the pathophysiology of the skin to begin with. Skin is comprised of two distinct layers. There's the epidermis and the dermis and then there's the underlying subcutaneous tissue. The skin is the largest organ in the body and it covers 20 square feet and can weigh up to six to eight pounds. 
So what does the skin do for us? Well, primarily it provides protection and protection from microorganisms, bacteria, and the like that could invade our body. It gives us temperature regulation. It provides fluid and electrolyte balance. It helps with metabolism by excreting the end product of cell metabolism. Um, certainly it provides us with sensations such as touch and pain. Um, and there's an excessive amount of nerve endings in the wound, uh, in the skin itself. It provides synthesis such as that of vitamin D. When the skin is exposed to the sun, it can process the vitamin D into our system. It provides us with communication. The outermost layer of the skin is called the epidermis, and it can be anywhere from 0.1 to 1 millimeter thick. It can be very fragile, and so we want to protect it carefully. Uh, it tends to be slightly acidic in its, in its well-protected and, and normal status, and this is important to remember uh, when we're using soaps and cleansers on the skin because they can significantly alter the pH and then open us up to skin damage. Um, it regenerates very quickly and it contains melanocytes which uh, provide our pigment, pigment for us. So what does the epi epidermis do for us? Well, it's that first layer, that protection layer. Um, it also <coughs> provides, a, a, it's where our skin regenerates itself and the organization of the cells happens there. Um, it provides our allergen reaction and recognition and it helps us maintain dermal contact. You can see why it's an important uh, goal to keep the skin intact and keep the epidermis intact because of all the functions of the epidermis itself. The dermis, the next layer down, that provides our strength and support. That's where the blood and oxygen are provided. Um, this is what helps us resist shearing forces that break down under pressure. So again, we want to keep that dermis intact. Um, the dermis is where the moisture is retained, and this is where the inflammatory response occurs. Um, the dermis also contains things like the sebaceous glands, uh, which secrete sebum, which um, help moisturize and lubricate our skin, and it protects the underlying structure, such as the muscles, the bones, and the organs. And then just below that is the subcutaneous layer. Also referred to often as the hypodermis, it attaches the top structures to the underlying structures. This is where our thermal protection happens. This is where calories are stored. Um, certainly pr provides our body shape, uh, some more than others, and it um, acts as our mechanical shock absorber. In the subcutaneous tissue is where the blood vessels, the nerves, and the lymphatic vessels are stored. And uh, it's why we see that oftentimes in stage 3s and stage 4 pressure ulcers that uh, descend into the subcutaneous layer, there's less pain with those types of wounds. So wouldn't it be nice if every skin that we go out to assess on a daily basis were as straightforward and intact and beautiful as a newborn baby skin? Unfortunately, we all know that it's not. So let's talk about those factors that alter the skin's normal um, ability. Age is the first one. Uh, as we age, our elasticity and our regeneration slow, and that slowing of regeneration starts as early as 30. So certainly in our senior patients who are well beyond that age, their turnover of skin cells slows. Um, if they've been exposed to sun over the years, if they're not well hydrated, um, if we're assaulting them with harsh soaps, um, if they're nutritionally compromised or on a lot of medications, all of those impact um, the normal status of the skin. So before we talk about how to describe the wounds, let's talk about the different type of wounds that exist, because this is where we need to start in our documentation. There are a lot of forces that impact skin integrity. And these are the things that um, become the etiology of the wounds themselves. There's the mechanical forces such as pressure, friction, and shear. There's moisture and chemicals uh, such as body fluids, skin cleansers, um, irritants in the environment. Uh, there could be vascular damage from venous or arterial disease, uh, infectious agents from breakdown of the skin such as bacterial agents which could result in cellulitis or folliculitis. Um, 
there's viral agents that could result in herpes simplex or um, herpes zoster, and then there's fungal uh, irritants that can be uh, result in things like candidiasis. Allergic reactions certainly to local um, stimulus as well as to medications and radiation dermatitis. To describe a wound, you want to understand its etiology first. Let's talk about mechanical forces. The one we most see often, uh, depending on our environment, um, is pressure ulcers, right? So in long-term care, we see pressure ulcers predominantly as the type of wounds that we see um, in that population. But if you're working in an LTAC, you might encounter more long-standing chronic wounds or complex surgical wounds. Certainly in the acute care environment, clinicians see a wide variety of wounds, including things like traumas, surgical sites, burns, um, and pressure ulcers, just to name a few. The picture on your left side of your screen is a stage four pressure ulcer on the right trochanter. And the skin, um, I'm sorry, the photo on the right side of your screen is an unstageable sacral ulcer. Another type of uh, skin alteration from mechanical forces are skin tears. And certainly in long-term care with our fragile population, we see these in a high incidence. Moisture can be devastating to the skin when it's in excess of normal parameters. So incontinence-associated dermatitis is a newer category that's been defined for us. It's defined as an inflammation of the skin as a result of chronic or repeated exposure to urine and fecal matter. And it manifests itself as redness with or without blistering that results in skin erosion. It's often um, due to urinary or fecal incontinence. And once this erosion happens, that predisposes that person to further infections, um, certainly the development of pressure ulcers, and a fair amount of pain associated with it. We'll talk a little bit how to differentiate between IAD and pressure ulcers as we get further into our assessments. This is a newer category of definition that was provided to us when the um, pressure ulcer staging categories were redefined in 2007 by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. Um, when we differentiate between IAD and a pressure ulcer, when we see IAD, it's generally, again, associated with exposure to urine, stool, or drainage. It's very diffuse. Uh, we often find it in the skin folds. Uh, it's a partial thickness skin loss. You will not see necrotic tissue generally in IAD, and there's a lot of pain and itch itching associated with it because that very top layer of the epidermis has been denuded away, and all of those nerve endings are exposed. In a pressure ulcer, the etiology of a wound would be from friction and shear and pressure. Generally, it's over a bony prominence as opposed to in the skin folds. Um, partial thickness to full thickness skin loss happens in pressure ulcers, um, but you'll see necrosis um, in a pressure ulcer where you won't see one in an IAD situation. Pressure ulcers can have pain and itching associated with them as well. Here's a vascular ulcer, and it's important to differentiate vascular ulcers from pressure ulcers. These two wounds happen to be venous stasis ulcers. Um, they are a result of circulation getting down to the extremity but not being able to be circulated back up into the general circulation of the body. So it gets down but not back up. Once that blood gets down there and it pools, it loses its oxygenation, can't continue to nourish the tissues, and the tissues die off. Generally, we see venous stasis ulcers in the gator area, which is the area below the knee and above the ankle. They're generally very moist. They weep a lot. Oftentimes, they're filled with slough, as you can see here in this photo on the left. We have a lot of yellow slough in this wound bed, not atypical. We also see what we call a bottle-shaped leg, where it's much wider up in the calf area and narrows down to a skinny ankle. While our picture on the right shows an excessive amount of edema, which is not atypical with venous stasis disease, our picture on the left shows a leg that's near normal. So heavy uh, 
edema is not always characteristic in a venous stasis ulcer. Typically also we see with venous stasis ulcers this what we call hemosiderin deposits. This is the brown staining that we see in the periphery of the wound from the blood cells dying off and leaching into the tissue layers and causing a permanent staining of the skin. The other type of vascular ulcer we see is arterial. Arterial ulcers are the opposite of venous. The blood can't get to the lower extremity. There's a constriction somewhere that's preventing blood flow from even getting down to the distal portion of the body. Um, so the tissue dies off from lack of circulation. Generally in arterial ulcers we see, as we do here on the left, that the ulcer is very symmetrical, almost like a cookie cutter punch that area out. They tend to be on the dry side, not as much drainage or no drainage. Uh, the extremity itself will appear to be uh, narrow, thin, uh, the skin is often taut and shiny, and often the leg is hairless. Um, over on the right, what we're seeing here is a arterial ulcer in the very distal portion of the toes. So we've got no blood flow coming down to the tips of these toes, and we've got a lot of necrosis um, happening in those extremities. Neuropathic ulcers. Neuropathic ulcers uh, often are associated with diabetes, the underlying disease causing lack of sensation in the distal extremities. Therefore, we get pressure over bony prominences or, um, as we see here on the right, a, um, a prosthesis that wasn't fitting correctly, but the patient could not feel that the prosthesis was causing a problem and it eroded the bottom of the stump. Another classic characteristic of a neuropathic ulcer is what we see here on the left, which is this heavy, heavy callus around the edge. When we see ulcers like this, often on the plantar section of the foot, with this heavy callusing, that's a hallmark of a diabetic foot ulcer or a neuropathic ulcer. One of the trickier ulcers to identify and describe are sickle cell ulcers. They're often mistaken as venous stasis ulcers. They will appear in that gator area on the lower extremity. They tend to be wet and sloughy. And again, we need to look at the etiology of the wound and the underlying disease in the patient to decide if it's a sickle cell associated or not. Moving on more to the acute environment, we see trauma such as surgical wounds that have dehissed, traumatic injuries. Uh, here on the far left, we see a dog bite. Um, in the center, we have a um, traumatic injury to the hand from a firecracker. And on the far right, here we have road rash from an auto accident. Another category that we see more in the acute setting are thermal injuries or burns. Burns fall into three categories. There are thermal injuries, chemical injuries, and electrical injuries. 30% uh, of burn injuries are thermal. We see them often um, on the trunk, on the arms, the face, the neck, and certainly young children are at high risk for thermal injuries. However, this picture on the left is a thermal injury for our diabetic patient, so he had decreased sensation in that distal extremity, and he was too close to a space heater and didn't realize it and burned himself. On the right, we have what we call an immersion burn, um, where the hand was plunged into hot water. Our next photo shows us an electrical burn, and these can be tricky because they don't always appear right away. Um, we need to look for an entrance and an exit site with electrical burns because the electricity will travel through the tissues. Oftentimes there's deep tissue injury from the electrical uh, current passing through the tissue, and it takes a while for that injury to reveal itself on the surface. Um, there's oftentimes a secondary sort of flash burn that shows up after an electrical shock. And chemical burns. Chemical burns tend to be smaller in size than thermal burns, um, but they're more likely to be full thickness because once that chemical comes in contact with the, the um, skin and disrupts its, its normal acid balance, then it can burn through the layers very quickly. 
Um, types of things that cause chemical burns can be alkalis, acids, organic compounds. Um, alkalis would be an example of um, oven cleaner or drain cleaners or fertilizers. Even cement and concrete are considered alkalis and can cause chemical burns. Acids would be things like uh, caustic bathroom cleaners, rust removers, uh, swimming pool chem chemicals, and organic compounds such as phenols and gasoline um, found in diesel fuel can be a, uh, organic compounds that can cause chemical burns. Then there's this other category, other types of wounds. So we have cancerous lesions, we have infectious agents, inflammatory reactions or medicine-induced reactions, um, metabolic rashes, and general rashes. So let's look at some infectious agents. Our picture on the left um, is herpes aster. This is, presents itself as red and clear papules. Um, they can be hemorrhagic in nature, and here we see them on the back of the leg. Um, on the right side, we're seeing hepatic lesions uh, from um, another form of herpes that have spread, has spread widely across the extremities. Cancerous lesions are not uncommon to see, especially in our long-term ter care population. Um, on the left, we're seeing widespread squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma on the lower extremities. And on the right, we're seeing a basal cell carcinoma on the face. So now that we've identified what kinds of wounds we might see, let's talk about how to prepare to assess it. First of all, when you go to assess a wound, the first thing that you want to do is cleanse that wound, first and foremost. So you want to remove your dressing, cleanse the wound, and then proceed into your assessment. So Ann, this is Deborah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to make sure we understand, why is it important to clean the wound before assessing? Why is the order important? That's a great question. Um, a lot of times we want to take that dressing off and start measuring right away, but we're not getting a true vi vision of what that wound bed is when we don't cleanse it first. We want to remove any loose debris, any drainage that might be clinging to the wound bed, any residue from a dressing. Hydrocolloids in particular can leave a lot of residue behind in the wound bed, so I want to make sure we clean that away before we get a true picture of what that wound bed looks like. Now that we've cleansed our wound, let's talk about our comprehensive assessment. A comprehensive assessment of a wound should include these 10 parameters. Anatomic location, where is it located on the body? The etiology, what we just talked about, what caused this wound and what category does it fall into? The dimensions of the wound, and we're going to talk about measuring in a moment. What tissue type is or is not in the wound bed? The exudate, not only in volume, but in type what our wound edges look like, what the peri wound margin looks like, um, whether or not infection is being identified, and whether or not the patient is having pain related to that wound itself. So let's start with anatomic location. For pressure ulcers, what bony prominence is it over? Our little man diagram here has numbers all over him, and those are all the numerous body parts, uh, bony prominences that a pressure ulcer can occur over. For dermal wounds, be as descriptive and as accurate as you possibly can. It's important that we use uh, professional anatomic locations to describe where they are. For instance, make sure we're getting left and right correct. This could be lethal in a chart if we don't have these correct. And it's often difficult when you're upside down and backwards looking at that heel ulcer or that foot ulcer with a patient in a wheelchair. But let's make sure we get our left and right correct. Keep in mind that the coccyx and the sacrum are two separate sites. The sacrum is the lower back. The coccyx is right there over the tailbone. Use professional terms like trochanter instead of hip. It's more specific. Um, the trochanter is the outer hip area over the outside of the joint. The ischial tuberosity is down below uh, the curve of the buttocks where we sit. Make sure we differentiate between medial and lateral. Keeping in mind medial means middle. 
so the middle of the body versus the lateral part of, part of the body, anterior, posterior, and plantar versus dorsal. I always remember plantar as I plant my foot on the ground, so that's the plantar portion of my foot. It's the way I keep it straight in my head since I've been a nurse for so many years. Etiology, what caused this wound? What can I do to eliminate that cause? And what interventions are appropriate? This is what starts us on our path of how are we going to treat this wound. Wound measurements. So here's the hotly debated question I get all the time. Do I actually have to have three dimensions? And the answer is yes. We want length, we want width, and we always want depth. Good standard of, of measurement. Also, the standard uh, increment for measuring is always in centimeters, never inches, I never use references like pea size or um, dime size, not professional documentation. Get your measuring tool out and put your measurements in your chart. To measure length, you want to place your measuring guide at the greatest length going from head to toe. So find not the center of the wound, but the largest spans of the wound, head to toe, and that's your length. To get width, turn 90 degrees perpendicular to that. Place the measuring guide at the greatest width or side to side. That's your width. To measure depth, you want to gently insert a probe into the wound, into the deepest part of the wound that you can identify. Mark that applicator, whether it's your finger or whether it's a um, cotton tip swab and then lay that measuring uh, guide next to that and get your depth off of that. Uh, there are new measuring guides on the market that actually have um, our cotton tip swabs with measuring guides up the stick that are great, so you eliminate a step there. Look for those in your supply catalog next time. So when we talk about the extent of tissue loss, this is important because depth describes what the wound visually looks like, but it doesn't tell us what the wound is. Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, NPUAP, gave us new definitions for pressure ulcers in 2007. Uh, you can look those up online. And the new definitions include suspected deep tissue injury and the unstageable pressure ulcer, as well as IAD. Um, we want to make sure that when we're describing burns, they have their own classification, first, second, third, and fourth degree burn. Other dermal wounds can be described as partial thickness or full thickness. And diabetic foot ulcers have their own advanced assessments beyond describing the wounds, such as the Wagner scale, the SAD scale, or the University of Texas scale. It's important to note that Pressure ulcers are the only ulcers that we stage, and it was very clearly defined by NPUAP in 2007. Pressure, that staging 1, 2, 3, 4, DTI or unstageable applies to pressure ulcers only. Went too far, sorry about that. So this is an example of a partial thickness skin loss, right? This is a right forearm and a hand from a motorcycle accident where the skin was abraded off. It's not pressure, it's not vascular, so it's a partial thickness trauma and just the epidermis has been eroded away and the dermis is exposed. Let's talk about tissue types. When we're describing tissue types, we want to describe what is there and what is not there. So examples of viable tissue would be granulation tissue, clean non-granulating tissue, or epithelial tissue. Um, Non-viable tissue would be examples of eschar and slough. I'm going to show you some pictures in a moment. You also might be able to visualize in that wound bed things like muscle, tendon, or subcutaneous fat. And if those are present, you want to describe them in the wound bed as well. When you describe what tissue types are or are not present, attach a percentage to them. So tell me either is there 50% granulation and 50% slough, or is there only 20% granulation and 80% clean but non-granulating tissue in that wound bed? Granulation tissue. 
Granulation tissue is beefy and red and moist. It's got a berry-like appearance, lots of lumps and bumps. Um, oftentimes it's described as raw hamburger. <laughs> I know, graphic, but it works, right? Clean non-granulating non tissue looks particularly different. In a clean non-granulating wound, as you can see in this picture, we have a nice clean wound. There's no slough. There's no necrotic debris in there, but it's flat and smooth. It's lacking in that berry-like or bumpy appearance. So clean non-granulating is different than granulating tissue. It tells us a lot about what's going on in that wound bed. Epithelial tissue, one of the hardest tissues to describe at times. With epithelial tissue, as you can see where our arrows are pointing, we now have new flat epidermis cells that have regenerated, and they're starting at the edges here and beginning to migrate across this wound bed. It appears as a pale pink, maybe almost white. It's kind of flat in appearance, and it's not quite as shiny as our nice moist granulation tissue. In fact, this wound bed here looks a little hypergranulated to me. That granulation tissue is butted up over the edge of the, the wound bed itself. Funny thing about epithelial tissue, epithelial cells, I call them lazy. They don't like to migrate across, except across the perfect environment. That environment has to be moist. That environment has to be flat for them to come up across. So if we have uh, any kind of depth left to the wound, we're not going to get epithelial migration. That's why we want a wound to granulate to the surface first and then epithelialize across. Non-viable or necrotic tissue comes in a couple different formats. The presence of necrotic tissue in a wound bed signifies an alteration in tissue perfusion. Either the wound has been desiccated, or there's an increased bacterial load, or there's lack of circulation to that wound bed. One form of devitalized or necrotic tissue is called eschar. Um, it can be black or brown. It can be loose or adherent. It can be moist or dry. It can be hard or soft. can't quite make up its mind, can it? So here's some hard black eschar, and on the left, what we're seeing is really a large expanse with a hard red peri wound margin. This is telling us an awful lot about this wound right here. This wound has been here a long time. This wound um, has a lot going on underneath it because this peri wound margin is bright red and we can see that it doesn't extend out, it stays right. So this is not from drainage, this is not IAD, this is not excoriation. This is most likely infection, but until we get that hard black cap off, we don't know for sure. Over here on the right, we're seeing hard black heels. Hard black heels, if they're intact like this, we want to leave them alone, right? The standard of care is do not remove. Here's a couple more pictures of Eskar for you. Here on the left, even better, this hard black heel. So this is a black cap. This is the body's own defense mechanism. It's holding everything intact, and this is sort of the body telling us, I can't do anything with this wound right now, so I'm going to just protect this area. Right? So perhaps there's not good blood circulation. Perhaps there's not good glucose control. Perhaps there's not adequate nutrition. Whatever's going on in the patient systemically, the body's capped off this wound and said, I want to stay intact. If you remove this cap prematurely, you're probably going to end up removing that foot eventually. So until this cap starts to get soft, mushy, and loosen up by itself, you want to leave it alone and protect it. Flip side of that is over here on the right, we have some wounds that have multiple tissue types in them here. So here we see our necrotic tissue kind of scattered through this wound bed, but we also see some, some clean uh, pink tissue uh, existing side by side. Here we have a large necrotic patch, but next to it we have some pink tissue as well. And we can see already that the edges of this wound, perhaps this wound existed before, that could be scarring right up in there, uh, and this wound closed once before and then reopened. <laughs> 
So as I said before, when you're describing your tissue types in your wound bed, don't only tell me what's there, but tell me what percentage I'm seeing here of necrotic tissue versus clean non-granulating tissue. Another form of necrotic tissue is slough. Slough is also devitalized tissue. It can be anywhere from yellow, tan, gray, or even white in color. It's generally firmly adherent, and it can be loose and stringy, or it can be little tiny buds that adhere to the wound bed. Oftentimes it looks like a drainage that's in the wound bed, but when you go to cleanse it away with a, a 4 by 4 and some saline, it sticks to the wound bed. That's slough. Here's some examples. Certainly on the left here we can see this is pretty clearly uh, necrotic slough. It's yellow, it's stringy, it's moist. We can see some black eschar remaining around the edges here. So some, whether it was through um, applying of moisture with a hydrogel or a hydrocolloid or whether it was through an enzymatic debrider, we've been breaking down this hard black slough and now we're down to the yellow stringy slough. On the flip side over here on this this uh, neuropathic ulcer that we saw earlier in the slides, we've got a lot of yellow fibrin slough that's adhering to this wound bed. This wound bed's a little on the drier side, and we've got a lot of devitalized tissue. We need to provide some moisture to that wound bed and get rid of that necrotic slough. Keep in mind, please, that a scab is not necrotic tissue. A scab is a crusted area of dried, hardened blood and serum over the surface of the wound. Scabs really should be removed by uh, providing moisture to loosen them up and dissolve them away, and then keep that wound moist. A scabbed wound is not a healed wound. Now that we've just described our tissue type, let's talk about our exudate. So our drainage, we want to describe two ways. First, we want to give the amount, just like we did with our tissue type. So anywhere from none to heavy. And then what type of drainage are we seeing? Serous, that's our clear watery fluid. And uh, it's been separated from the solid elements in the wound bed. Serosanguinous is a mix of thin, clear, blood-tinged um, drainage that composed of serum and blood together. Sanguinous, uh, that gene means generally bloody, and purulent, which is producing or containing pus. Let's describe our wound edges. Tell me a story. Wound edges tell us a lot about what's going on in that wound. Is that wound beginning to epithelialize? Um, can the wound edges be rolled under, which means it's a chronic wound? It gives us a lot of stories about the etiology of the wound. So when we describe our wound edges, we want to describe them as attached or unattached. We want our wound edges to be attached and flush with the wound base so that those epithelial cells have a chance to develop and migrate across the wound once the wound bed has filled in. Um, unattached wound edges are an indication of undermining being present. And that's why the dermis and the epidermis have separated from each other from the um, subcutaneous later, and we can slide in there. And I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, is that wound edge scarred or fibrotic? Um, that means that the wound has rolled over on its edges and has closed off, and that wound is never going to close. If you have uh, rolled edges, you need to get in there with uh, assistance, either with silver nitrate or with a scalpel, and rough up, open up those edges again. A rolled fibrotic edge will never, never close. So undermining. Definition of undermining is tissue destruction that occurs underneath intact skin on the perimeter of the wound. It's often seen and associated with shearing, and it generally will involve a significant portion of the wound edge. When we measure our undermining, we want to gently insert a cotton tip applicator or an under measuring device into the area of the undermining. And we want to note how far back that goes. So we place a mark on our applicator and then lay it next to our measuring guide and indicate how deep the undermining is. Then we want to look at the wound as a clock with the head of the patient being 12 o'clock and the feet of the patient being 6 o'clock. And we want to describe where on that clock that undermining exists. So we might say that the undermining runs from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock and that it extends three centimeters back. 
Here's some examples of undermining. We can see clearly here on the left that this edge is lifted up and that we can slide our fingers back underneath in there. Again, here on the right, we can see that we've got a flap of skin exposed here and a clear lifted edge around the um, perimeter of the wound. In addition to measuring your undermining, you want to make sure that when you pack the wound, you pack the undermining as well. Tunneling. Tunneling differs from undermining. Tunneling, tunneling is um, often described also as a sinus tract. Uh, that's usually done by physicians. Um, tissue destruction occurring in any direction from the surface uh, or the edge into the dead space of the wound. Uh, tunnels are potential for abscess formation, so we want to make sure we identify them and we pack them well before we pack the rest of the wound. When you measure a tunnel, just like measuring your undermining, you want to make sure that you put your cotton tip applicator or other measuring device into the tunnel, mark how deep it goes, lay that against your measuring device, and record the depth of the tunnel, and then again, back to your clock. So you might say that at 4 o'clock, you have a 2 centimeter tunnel in the wound bed. Here's an example of a tunnel. So we have a wound on a foot, and we have an uh, opening here on the um, medial portion of the foot, and then we have an opening here on the plantar portion of the foot, and lo and behold, there's a tunnel that connects the two right one to the other. So Anne, a question has come in. Do you have any tips for us on how to tell the difference between tunneling and undermining? Well, as I was describing, let's go back two slides. Whoop. There we go. So as I was describing, you want to make sure that, that you're looking at the edges of the wound and then you're looking in the base of the wound. Undermining is going to occur around the edges. It's literally that lifting. Uh, the description I use most often is a big old chicken. and This may gross out a few folks, but here it goes. When you take a chicken or a turkey at the holidays and you lift the skin off and you put beautiful butter and herbs and seasonings under that skin between the skin and the meat, that's exactly what's happening, minus the butter and the herbs, mind you, um, on this wound here. The skin is lifting off from the meat underneath and you can slide a measuring device or slide your fingers up under that skin. That's undermining. Tunneling is a true tunnel, a hole, a pathway like we see in this foot picture between um, one space and another. Now you might, it might not connect like this picture does, but it's a sinus tract going down into the wound. Now we've described our wound edges and identified whether there's tunneling or undermining. So let's look at the peri wound margin. Peri wound margin tells us so much and it's oftentimes really neglected in, in descriptions of what um, is going on with that wound bed. Uh, ways to describe peri wound skin could be erythema, or redness, edema, uh, maceration, which we'll talk about in a minute, denuded or bogginess, induration, which is that hardness we see uh, associated with infection in a wound bed. Uh, there could be a dermatitis or epidermal stripping, or the presence of yeast or a callus on the, present, uh, on the peri wound margin. Um, edema is important to note because it could be a sign of venous obstruction, thrombophobitis, or pressure from a bandage or a cast that hasn't been applied appropriately. Uh, oftentimes when there's corticosteroid going on, uh, there's inflammatory reactions which can result in edema around the edges of a wound. Uh, denuded describes the loss of the epidermis altogether, and calluses are that thickening of the stratum corneum around the edges of the wound, and we'll see a picture of that in just a moment. So here on the left, we're seeing quite a bit of erythema around the edges. So this was a patient who was left on a bedpan for a long period of time and developed pressure ulcers. We've got a lot of erythema around these edges and in between the wound margins, and we've also got some denuded skin here going on. So we want to make sure we note that. Here on the right is our calloused foot again, and a calloused uh, plantar wound means what? That's right, a diabetic foot ulcer. 
Maceration. Maceration is that softening of tissue from soaking in fluids. Think of having your hands in a pan of soapy water or doing dishes for a long time and the pads of your fingers get wrinkly and boggy. That's maceration. It's often white and spongy, although in darkly pigmented individuals it may be more gray than white. And the causes of maceration are generally excessive wound exudate that's not being controlled by your dressing, um, exposure to urine or liquid stool, or excessive perspiration by the patient. Here's two pictures of maceration. So the one here on the left is, is the one we see most typically. We have this white uh, ring around the edge of the wound. We got a nice pink wound center here, but we got a white ring around the wound. That means that too much moisture is being trapped by the drain dressing around the edges of the wound. Here on the left, this is an odd site, right? This center of this wound looks fairly dry. So why do we have this thick white area around the edges? My guess is that we're not putting the dressing on correctly and so the moisture we're trying to contribute to the center of the wound is ending up on the healthy tissues around, tissues around the edge and causing maceration. So this is damaging our wound margin and again it's impeding um, a healthy area for epithelial cells to develop on and migrate across once we clean up and heal in this wound center here. So I want to make sure when we see this maceration that we look at where is that moisture coming from and that we control that moisture better. Other types of peri wound margin disruptions that you might see are things like here on the left, this is candida or yeast um, around this excoriated area here. We can see that by the little tiny papules. Um, they call these satellite lesions. I call them uh, freckles. <laughs> and uh, they move out from the center around and that's a clear indication of yeast. You want to make sure that you're treating that with an antifungal and when you treat with an antifungal we always want to make sure that we treat for a minimum of 14 to 21 days to make sure that we clearly get the yeast out of the subcutaneous spaces and um, it doesn't reoccur on us. Here over on the right we see some denuded peri wound. So this could be from drainage, this could be from caustic um, uh, irritants coming in contact with the healthy skin, uh, this could be from a uh, uh, poorly applied dressing. Infection. We want to make sure we look for infection. Uh, clinical signs of infection might not always be present in our immunosuppressed patients or our patients with poor perfusion. So we want to be careful that we're looking for um, all signs and symptoms. Erythema and edema, warmth and odor, and purulent drainage. Those are the types of signs and symptoms that we're going to see in an acute infection, uh, such as a post-op wound or a otherwise healthy patient that has a wound that's become infected. However, in a chronic wound, the erythema and the odor and purulent drainage might not exist. We might just see some edema in the wound margin. We might see changes in the wound bed color going from a nice beefy red to a pale pink. And we might see an increase in serous drainage. All of those are indications of a chronic low-level infection existing in the wound bed and it still needs to be addressed. So here's a tricky one. Um, when you see tenderness, pain, fever, and elevated white count, we know for sure that we've got infection going on in that wound bed. However, when we see a wound like this, it's hard to tell. So this is a lower left extremity in a diabetic patient. We've got multiple wounds happening here on this leg, both back here and this whole outer ankle. The, red, the whole leg is red and inflamed and endematous. So now we have to decide is this infection or is this vascular disease or is it a combination of the two. Make sure you get all your facts before you make your decision. Certainly we want to document pain um, and the level to which that pain is present in a wound itself and does that wound cause distress to the patient. You know, they consider pain the fifth vital sign. It's very important um, both for good comprehensive patient care as well, as well as for our regulatory issues that we're documenting pain and how we're addressing that pain. Uh, 
pain can be an indication of infection or deterioration, and it, but it also might be an indication that the dressings we're using are not appropriate and need to be rethought. When you're assessing pain, please use a um, validated pain tool and make sure that the pain is measured regularly and frequently, especially before and after a dressing change is performed. The last part of your documentation, now that we have the statistics down, is we want to talk about whether the wound is healing or not. Um, do we see progress in the wound bed? Have we seen positive or negative change since the last assessment? Oftentimes it can be helpful to use a validated tool to help us uh, monitor and document progression of wound healing. Some tools that um, are used commonly throughout the um, system, healthcare system are the PUSH tool, which was developed by the NPUAP, and directions for the PUSH tool can be found on the NPUAP website. Uh, the BWAT, this is the um, Bates-Jensen Wound Assessment Tool. It was formally uh, described as the PSST, or the Pressure Source Status Tool. Uh, it addresses both pressure and non-pressure wounds, and um, can be found through Barbara Bates-Jensen's uh, website as well. There's the OASIS tool, commonly seen in home health. Any one of these can help you objectively measure whether healing is occurring in your wound bed or not. Uh, just a note on wound photography, I'm a proponent of wound photography, um, but when you use photography, make sure that you use it in conjunction with a comprehensive assessment. Your photo should support your assessment, and your assessment should support your photo. When you're documenting your assessment, make sure you document, certainly on admission to your care, whether it's to your facility or into home health. Um, per protocol, typically we see a comprehensive assessment done at least one, once every seven days, but in more acute environments, it could be once every three to four days. Uh, certainly when there's a change in condition, uh, post-debridement, you want to reassess that wound, and after it's debrided, you want to make sure you cleanse it thoroughly and then assess it. And definitely prior to discharge, you want to debrief, uh, you want to assess and document that wound. Make sure when you assess that wound, in general, you want to look at the patient's overall condition. You want to look at the wound severity. Um, any, you want to note any topical treatments that are going on in your plan of care. And you want to document your overall goals. What interventions are put, being put in place? So if you're dealing with a pressure ulcer, what are you doing to relieve that pressure and alleviate the cause of that wound? Um, how is the patient responding to the interventions? Not only did they tolerate the dressing change appropriate, uh, at an appropriate level, but how overall is the wound doing and is their um, uh, general body status responding to the treatment? Keep in mind, especially as we move into an electronic age, that you may not be able to add, delete, or modify your, um, your uh, documentation the way we used to do with pen and paper. So make sure that you include things like changes to your treatment plan or changes in response to the situation before you close out your note. So that's my blurb on how to document A to Z on a wound. I know it's a lot of information to take in, but once you get it down into a pattern, you'll find that doing a comprehensive assessment helps you track your outcomes better. Better outcome tracking leads to, leads to better care for our residents overall. So thank you for attending today, and I'm going to turn the floor back over to Deb Kurtz. And thanks for a really great program. Um, I, I, I tell people I could probably learn calculus from you. So thank you so much for a great presentation today. There's a few more items uh, that we'd like to share with you to aid to your learning today. Uh, first of which is Anna's compiled a comprehensive list of references for us. And these are in your handouts. If you've registered in advance, you got those handouts emailed to you prior to this program today. Rest assured, for those of you who didn't get them in advance, we're sharing this handout along with your CEU information via email today or early tomorrow.
and has also compiled, as you can see, a list of skin and wound care resources, including some of the resources that she pulled some of this material from today. We certainly heard a lot from the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel today, and we also saw a great deal of photography from the Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses Society. So big thanks to that, and also the um, AAWC. Um, this uh, webinar would not be complete without a thank to our sponsor, Wound Rounds. Wound Rounds is the electronic point of care wound management and prevention solution. And users of Wound Rounds have reported some really incredible outcomes that have listed here on your screen. So wanted you to also be aware that you can reach out to Ann Schurig um, independent of this webinar. Her contact information is listed here. She is a wealth of information and is always helpful in discussing with anyone any types of wound questions or opportunities. So wanted you to um, make note of her information and this is also included in the handout that is being um, emailed to all of our participants. So if you don't have a pen, don't worry. Lastly, I wanted to let everyone know what's coming up next. So for those of you who are interested in CEUs who are listening to this presentation live, the next step is you'll be receiving an email from Wound Rounds, which will have instructions on what you need to do to complete the CEU requirement, which is, as you know, of course, getting uh, your post-test and your evaluation forms completed. We will be providing a one-week window in order to get those materials back to us. So there, uh, these materials will be due back to Wound Rounds on April 25th, so that's a week from today. And in this email, one more time, you will be getting a copy of the handout from today's presentation, which I'm sure will be very useful to you. Um, for those of you who have attended multiple Wound Rounds webinars, you know that we have a dedication to providing education to members of the wound care community. So keep apprised of your email to see what's coming up next from Wound Rounds in our educational series. And lastly, one more time, a big thanks to Wound Rounds for making this all happen today. I'm Deborah Kurtz, I'm your moderator on behalf of Wound Rounds and my compelling speaker and co-presenter today, Ann Schurig. Thank you so much for attending and hope you got a great deal out of this webinar today. Thank you.